Welcome to the Big Fellas Podcast, where we chop it up about all things past, present, and future about the game of basketball. Where facts, stats, and context reign supreme. That is blasphemous. Sometimes it gets crazy, but we always keep it real. Always keep it real. Get ready to learn from players, coaches, and fans from all levels of the game and see the court in a brand new way. And now, fresh off the sidelines, here's your host, John Hartofillis. What it do, fellas, and welcome to the Big Fellas Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, JH, coming to you from New York City, the mecca of basketball. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Dan O'Brien, Director of Sports Medicine and Research for the National Basketball Players Association. I spoke with Dan about what the NBPA does behind the scenes to benefit players' safety, his department's role in giving players a second opinion, and how the bubble became a reality from the medical side. We've got a good one in store for you today, fellas. Episode number 48, Dan O'Brien, Director of Sports Medicine. Hey, Dan, what's going on? Hey, John. How are you, man? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, it's really cool. Uh, no, you're, you're in the, actually in the NBA offices right now in, in the city. It's obviously a lot of fun. And thank you for taking the time to come chat because the stuff you do is really cool. It's, a, it's an interesting perspective and I can't wait to unpack it. Yeah, of course. And it is, uh, one, one of the silver linings, I think, of, of this pandemic is all the, uh, the virtual meetings we've had. And it's good to get on and do some virtual podcasts in the meantime as well. So excited to talk to you today. Of course. So taking it back a little bit, what kind of sparked that interest for you in, in basketball, whether as a kid or or as you kind of went on, what, what kind of sparked that for you? Yeah, man, I don't have your traditional, I haven't been a basketball life for my, you know, since, I, since I've been a kid, I, I've been a sports fanatic. I think I, I was always enamored by athletes at a young age, you know, four or five years old, I would just watch sports, sports, sports. I never really got into like the Disney channel or the cartoons or anything. So I've always been enamored by sports and athletes. And I think that kind of took me to my career path, which ended up being more like the sports medicine route. But, you know, I followed more of the, the occupation, which led me to, to the basketball world and, here I am now. So not your traditional basketball life or story, but I guess it's a little different perspective here. Of course. And that's why it's so interesting because everyone has their own spin or their own story, but why they enjoy watching the game, why they enjoy loving it, why they enjoy playing it. And it's always interesting to hear that, that perspective. So when you were in college, what kind of made you th- think about going into, into sports medicine and, and taking that path? Good question. So I think it all started with my love for sports. I knew I wanted to be involved in sports. I didn't know if I wanted to do sports management, sports medicine, and I ended up deciding that I wanted to be more hands-on and more clinical in whatever I did. So that led me more to the athletic training world. So I actually got my undergrad in athletic training, and I did that at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. And that's kind of what led me to basketball. I worked my first basketball clinical rotation there at Duquesne. So I was there for two years. I did another rotation at Robert Morris, did basketball there. And I just kind of fell in love with the game of basketball um, one as the game and two as the medical side too. I think there, there's advantages to working in basketball. I always joke around. It's like as an athletic trainer, if you're on the sidelines, you'd rather be indoors. So that's why basketball was always appealing. But all, all kidding aside, I think basketball teams are, are generally the smallest amount of athletes and it gives you a chance to build really good rapport with all of them and work closely with all of them um, and hopefully keep them all on the court at the same time. But that's kind of where I fell in love with basketball and working it and then subsequently fell in love with the game as well pretty interesting how the difference between basketball and other sports you always think about like the fan experience of you're not wearing helmets you can see their face and, and that kind of stuff but what you're saying is super true about how there's less players so you're able to build that connection with them from from a medical standpoint that's something that's super cool that you don't really hear too much of yeah i think i think it's i think that's part of the why the, the basketball players are some of the some of the highest paid and, and some of the most recognized players in the world because again you know, there's only five or six of them on the court. There's only five of them on the court. But, you know, again, there's, you know, really 10 guys that are playing the game. And um, you span that across the entire league. There's 450 players actively. And that's really it, as opposed to football, where you might see 450 players and, you know, on a couple of teams. So I think they're all recognizable. Uh, it's great for the game. And they obviously getting into the actual dynamics of the sport. They don't wear face masks or anything like that. So, this is kind of getting on a different realm, but yeah, that's, that's, that's why I think these guys are so marketable. That's the business side of it. But from the medical side, um, you know, it, it's really good to build relationships with players and it's been great here so far. So Dan, so you, you know, you started working with the NBPA, the NBA Players Association, and, and that's something that as fans, we see a lot of times that it pops up in news headlines, but we, you know, we don't really know a lot about what you guys actually do. Can you kind of go into detail on that a little bit? Yeah, of course. And it's, it's a good question. And, and frankly, I didn't have a great sense of what the union did before I came here and I've learned a lot the three years I've been here but you know you think about the the union it started back in the 60s as a labor union so there was the players had formed to get better pay to get better travel uh, accommodations 
to get better per diem and, and certain things like that. And they really only asked for a couple of things. And that's really what recognized or started the recognition of the union. Um, that was back in the 60s. And, and actually, Tommy Heinsohn was one of the starters of that. So rest in peace to Tommy, who, who passed away this week. But that's where it started. And it's evolved over the 60 years to an actual, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty good size. You have about 100 people working for the union now. And, and it spans everything from obviously legal matters to finance and, and my role is, is within the sports medicine department. So I, I represent players um, and work with them on a medical side. So that can be anything from, you know, getting a second opinion from a team or if a player wants to get a second opinion outside of a team, they'll come to us usually. Um, we work closely with agents because we also certify agents to the union. So that kind of filters back through all the departments. So especially on the medical side, we, we work with agents very closely for players that want to seek opinions. We work with our retired players on some cardiac screenings and keeping those guys healthy because, you know, again, those are, those are the guys that paved the way for our current players and the current players have made that a point that they want to give back to them. So we've done some good comprehensive medical screenings for the retired guys. And then just some educational stuff with the players that are coming into the league. It's a big jump from college to the NBA and not only physically, but, but mentally. So we're working with them on all the aspects that are involved there, just trying to prepare them. So it kind of, it kind of spans all, across all walks of life in, in the NBA world, but you know, we, we've been fortunate to have some good relationships with players and been able to help them with some situations um, that, you know, maybe otherwise they wouldn't have had as much success with. So that's kind of where I, I sit here at, at the union and, and uh, where our department uh, works the most. As fans, when you think of professional basketball medical staff, it's only the guys with a team. And okay, if someone gets hurt on the court, they go to the trainer comes, it, it stays there. But the, to think that there's another level to that and where you guys are overarching for all 30 teams is super cool. And, and even just for the players to have an unbiased resource in the medical side is huge. And, you know, the, the medical staffs with teams are, are generally really good, but, you know, there's always going to be some conflict of interest there. I mean, there's always going to be pressure from the ownership on team and down to the front office. And for players to have a... An unbiased group with no other appointments aside from the union is, is really important to them and someone that they can feel comfortable coming to for anything there. Yeah, so next time to our listeners, you're, you, you see an article about a player getting hurt and then there's that little dispute with the team of, oh, you're healthy or you're not, or that little back and forth. You guys are the, are the people that are, that are dealing with that or, or helping mediate that. So that's, that's super interesting to, to kind of wrap your head around. And then was the, was the medical department, was that like always around, like back in the 60s when the MBPA started or did that kind of get adopted later on? No, so that, that was adopted probably at this point, six years ago, my boss is Joe Rogowski, he's our chief medical officer. So he came on five years ago, maybe five or six years ago and started. And it started off as, you know, the main priority was those health screenings for the retired players. And it's, and it's evolved since. And, and given his background in the league, he was with the, the, the Rockets and the Orlando Magic for a while. He had already had some, some organic connections with the teams and with players. So it kind of was a natural fit and he's been able to kind of come in and build this out. And I came on three and a half years ago and you know, we've been excited at some of the, the projects we've done and, and some of the stuff that we have going on in the future. The medical landscape, the league must have been so different. And it's, it's funny like how, how important that transition is for players and, and they definitely know about it, but everyone else, the fans really, really don't. And then, so you started off as an athletic trainer, but then transitioned into this new director's role that you've been in since the start of 2020. Um, what does that kind of look like in terms of your, both your, how your roles have changed in that transition for you? Yeah. So if you think of a traditional athletic trainer, generally you're with the team, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, you, you know, if a player gets injured, you're, you're working through the rehab, you're trying to do preventative stuff for guys that aren't hurt. And mostly it's, it's a clinical team setting. Um, I came onto this role with the union, you know, kind of like with, with a dual dual function or dual role. It was, you know, half being medical coverage on site and half helping to run this facility that we have in Manhattan where guys work out. So there's a little bit of basketball ops, there's a little bit of athletic training involved. And we have guys that work out here in the off season and we have teams and that'll come in here when they play the Knicks or the Nets for, for shoot around or practice. So it kind of, it kind of, it kind of expanded across the whole board there, basketball ops, sports medicine. And now it's kind of transitioned, I'd say like 70, 30 to, to sports medicine. And that's where the director role came in, was more involved on the medical side, but I still do help and, and assist with, with the workouts here at the facility. But you know, the, the director role is kind of, expanded a bit and it, it was encompassing a lot more travel with the teams we would travel to all 30 teams um, once a year just to have our, our team awareness meetings and discuss important topics and trending topics with them there um, so that kind of took me away from the facility a little bit and, and I think that that's probably the major part the part is it was just the travel involved there and then obviously going to the events like combine and stuff to talk to the uh, to the rookies or, or to the pending rookies and and then after the draft is, is our rookie transition program. So having discussions with players that were drafted who are now in their cities and now know what teams are with, uh, just talking through some of the logistics there. So 
that's kind of where it's, where it's expanded and, and we're looking in the future again to some research stuff with our players and seeing how we can push the envelope there. That's, that's great because I was really thinking about game by game and team by team. And then what you put up in terms of like the NBA draft, that's an, a, a league event that you guys must obviously play a, a huge role in administering and being a part of. So that's, that's, I didn't even think of that at first. And I, and it's now it's funny because I have like these two worlds pre COVID and post COVID. Right. So I, I think everything looks so differently after. So pre COVID, you know, we've talked a lot about what, what we were doing and working on. I think now all of our focus has, has shifted to, you know, one was the bubble and, and getting those protocols up and ready. And, and now post bubble, getting ready for next season and what that looks like and, and making sure that our players are okay with the protocols that are being presented to us and, and getting those signed off and getting ready to play. I mean, gosh, in the next couple of weeks here. So that's, it, it, it's kind of expanded. I, I always, it's so cliche, but I always joke, you know, that there's no, no two days are the same on this job, but that's truly, that's truly the, um, I guess the epitome of it. That's so cool. When you brought up the bubble, so you guys kind of like set up all those guidelines, whether it's when they brought in new families and, and, and babies will have to come in now, is that something you guys like kind of handled and kind of told the NBA, like, this is what you guys should be doing. This is what you shouldn't be doing. It's a good question, John. So I think the way, the way I would look at it is obviously the leagues, the business side of it. So the league comes up with these protocols that they would run as a business and from the union side and the players, we, we are the more the checks and balances and say, okay, this is work. This will work. This is great. This, this might not work or this definitely won't work. So it's a lot of going back and forth, a lot of conversations, but it's truly a collaborative project. It has to be because if one side's out, it doesn't happen. So, you know, I think, you know, it was a true, truly a team effort pulling off the bubble and it was really cool to be a part of it and to experience it. But yeah, when there are certain things that come up, like having family and guests there, that was something that the union said was a non-starter. You know, if you can't have these guys be away for three months and not see their families and, and their children, that kind of thing. So if it was up to the league, I don't want to speak for them, but I imagine they would have as few people there as possible. And that would include no guests um, just from a risk mitigation standpoint. But, you know, as a union, again, we have to make sure that these players are okay with these protocols. And that was one major thing that they were pushing for is that to have family and guests there. So, yeah, so that, that, that would be a major part. And then obviously, uh, man, there's so much that goes into it, but I, that was probably, you know, it's interesting you say that was probably one of the biggest conversations I would imagine for, for pre-bubble and even going into that. Because I remember that the, the discussion about that, I'm just reading articles about it and thinking, okay, definitely behind the scenes, so much is going on. And, and that's so cool that you, you and your department are people behind the scenes. Yeah, it, it was, it was, it was everyone. It was really everyone involved. It's, um, you know, the union is obviously much smaller than the league and the yep. league has so many departments that go into, you know, they have player health, they have basketball strategy, they have basketball ops. And, you know, there's so many, so many people that did so much for, for that. It, it's really, it was just a few months in the bubble, but it felt like years leading up to it and during it. But I, I think the fact that all those departments with, with people with different disciplines and different backgrounds came together to pull off this one major event, it truly was just one major event, right? To pull it off was just fascinating to see and and to have a, you know, just to be a fly on the wall and, and observe it was amazing. So, but yeah, it, it was a lot of back and forth, a lot of discussions, everything from, like you said, from the players' guests to how long the quarantine period was when you arrived, to how long the, the families had to quarantine. And then obviously weighing like the, the health and safety benefits, right? Like, you know, some of the stuff isn't ideal, but from a health and safety, you know, standpoint, you know, we have to make sure that we're putting our players in the best position to be safe and, and not contract this virus. So there were some discussions there as well. So. A lot that went into it, a lot behind the scenes. I think someone uh, on the NBA side said this, and I liked it. It's the, it's the best project they never want to work on again. So I like we'll that. See, we'll see what happens. It was, it was funny. It was a good way to put it. I was down there from July. I wasn't there. I did the second half. So we split up. So my boss is our chief medical officer, like I had mentioned. He did the first half, which was a lot of the, the heavy lifting, right? Getting people in there, getting set, maybe putting out some fires with people that weren't happy with certain things. But the second half... I went in, so I went in from beginning of August until October, and it was a it was a great experience. But it was it was a long two months. I I, I give so much credit to anyone there that was a whole that was there the whole time. I, I can't imagine, um, but people did it. Players did it. It's a tremendous sacrifice on on the players' part, and I think the league recognized that, which is why I think we had, were able to come to some agreements for this season going going forward. And uh, it, it was it was great. But yeah, I was down there for a few months and awesome experience. But it was a long time to be away. I don't have, I don't have family or kids. So, you know, I'm sitting here from a, from a different perspective. I'm a lot of people. So, you know, if it was, if it was long for me, I can imagine it was, yeah, I imagine it was pretty long for other people as well. Of course. And that's obviously a huge benefit of, of being super young is that, I mean, if like, for example, like I'd be able to just drop everything and go wherever if I got the call. So, and that's just the same thing with a lot of people in our age. When you go, like you go from like the two extremes, but right? you go from like quarantine where, 
a lot of people are, are just stuck with family and, and there with them all day to bubble where now you you don't see them for months. So it, it is, it was, it was a huge adjustment. And I, I had that as well. I was with family for a couple months. I left New York city and then went out there and was, was alone for a while. So, I mean, it was good. There was good people in the bubble. It was good coworkers, but you know, it was, it was hard to escape work because it was work and you were there for the whole time. So, you know, it was definitely the two extremes, but you know, there was, there was definitely a mental component to it that certainly couldn't be underlooked and it wasn't, which was good, but we were prepared for it, but there certainly was a, a mental component that went to as well. And you touched on like, whether it's coworkers or, or your bosses, it, just, it got me thinking about kind of the mentors that you've had leading up to this point. What, what do some of those people look like, whether it's maybe people that helped you get break, get your foot in the door, what, what does that kind of look like for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I was actually thinking about this the other day too, John. It's funny you asked. So I think my, my first mentor is obviously my parents. And, you know, I, I think there's a couple of kinds of mentors. I think there's mentors that are, are kind of within your field that, you know, they're in positions that you want to be in. They, you look up to them. And there's also mentors that, and this is just totally my own perspective, there's mentors that you kind of look up to that maybe um, lead by example. Um, and maybe, they're, maybe they don't even know you're, you know, they're a mentor for you, but I've had a lot of those. So I'd say my, my most important ones are my parents. And I've always been so fond of my parents and my, and, and my dad. And I can, you know, I'm one of those people that everything I do, I, I, I kind of always revert back to my parents and, and making them proud and that kind of thing. So those are probably my biggest mentors. And I've had professional mentors within my field. So obviously my, my boss has been one and it just so happened to work out that I met him obviously when I got the job, but he's been really supportive and, and really helping to push the envelope and, and what I'm doing and, and what, what we're doing as a department. I think prior to that, at, when I did my graduate assistantship in, in Brooklyn, I had a mentor there who was the same, same, same as me, athletic trainer, had worked with the Knicks for a while and had some really good connections here. So he was definitely a mentor and someone who I could talk to about anything. But then obviously just, you know, being around the, the union and, and having some really smart, like really good, like there's some good lawyers here. Michelle Roberts is, is phenomenal. And then someone that I look up to and she's a leader you know, but I've never told Michelle she's a mentor, but just her leading by example is something that you, 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 you pay attention to, you watch, you watch with a close eye. And I think those are also important mentors too, where, you know, they're, they're, they're great in their respective fields, even not, even outside their respective fields, they're amazing. But, you know, I don't think it always has to be people within your, your profession or that kind of thing to be a mentor. So um, I have a lot of those and I won't name them all, but there's a lot of those um, and just the way people, uh, kind of handle situations and handle meetings and that kind of thing is fascinating too. So I could talk all day about mentors. I think they're so important that I think, but those are probably the, the major ones that, that I have so far. Obviously being very young, you're not too far away from your college years or, or when you were just started out, but obviously you've had a lot of experiences since then and some especially unique experiences that st stuff like the bubble that most people haven't had. During that time, what are some lessons that you've learned that you go back and tell a 20 year old Dan O'Brien that, that he didn't really know at the time? Ooh, good question. Um, I think, so the, one of the, one of the biggest lessons I learned in the bubble and I, and it's something I, I continuously work on. It's something I, I realize, but it's hard to actually, you know, it's like, you know, at, you know, it's easier to say than do is kind of like let life come to you or, or that, that famous saying, like, if it, I think this, is, it's something along these lines, if it doesn't, if it won't matter in five years, don't worry about it in for five minutes or something like that. So, you know, there was a lot of kind of uneasiness or anxiety in the bubble when I, and I got in there at the beginning of August. And then if you remember on August 26th, we had that, that stoppage in play for the social unrest, um, which was really a great gesture by the players. But there was also a lot of uncertainty about what, what the next day was going to look like. Am I flying home after this? Is this gonna, or am I going to be here until October? And then going even before that, like even during quarantine, it's like, well, am I, going to, am I going down in the bubble? Am I going back to New York City? Just a lot of, again, uncertainty of what tomorrow held. And there was a lot of anxiousness around it. And, and, and I think this, I'm speaking for a lot of people here. I think a lot of people experienced this. And then you kind of look back and, and like, uh, like a couple, a couple of weeks, a couple of months later, you're like, oh, that was silly to worry about. So that's probably the biggest thing I've worried about is to go, go with the flow and be present. And especially in the bubble. I mean, there was so much uncertainty there. Um, and that was probably a microcosm of, of this entire world we're in right now, the pandemic and, and moving forward, but controlling what you can control, not worrying about things that you can't control. Um, I think is so important right now because we really can only control so little. Um, and I think that it's applied to the job a little bit as well. And just trying to, to put realistic expectations on the table for the season um, and working together with the lead to do that, I think is important. So that would probably be my biggest piece of advice. And there's probably some recency bias there because I think that's probably what's been on my mind a lot or it was. 
Um, but that'd probably be the biggest piece I'd, I'd imagine that I'd tell myself, my 20 year old self, whatever I was doing at 20, but probably 20 year old self. That's great advice because that is stuff that we get caught up in all the time. And it's important to be able to stay present and get over, overcome that. So Dan, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, this was a great conversation and I learned so much about a side, a side of the league that, you know, you don't really hear about too much. And it's, it's great. I mean, as a, as someone that loves the game to, to learn all this, all these new things. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, John, thanks for having me, man. And good luck with the podcast. We've had some awesome guests. I'm, I'm proud to be up just a part of that. So I look forward to listening in for the rest of them. Thanks for listening to the Big Fellas Podcast. Check us out on all major social media platforms at Big Fellas Pod to join the chop up. You can also listen to us on every podcast platform on the planet. Stay tuned for the next episode, Big Fellas.